Hello and welcome in today's session. Today, we have chosen the topic appropriation of water resources for today's lecture. The main focus will be on the study resources, uses, practices in water to analyze the various traditional methods of water conservation as practiced by human societies, utilization patterns adopted by various civilizations of the world kept on changing with the developments in technology for the better appropriation of water and with the growing demand for water for various development activities. The issue of water rights from the historical perspective. The earth is sometimes called the water planet as this is the only member in our solar system that has an abundant supply of water. Water is used as a raw material for various metabolic processes. It's an important ecological factor. It's also a very good solvent medium and has sustained life on earth ever since the biological origins of living organisms. Water as a resource has been known to humans since the remotest past and has been used by them as essential life supporting ingredient. Water as a resource. Water is one of the important substances necessary for life. Water covers about 75% of the earth's surface occurring in lakes, rivers and oceans. The oceans alone contain 97% of the water on earth. India has a total of 1,122 cubic kilometer of water of which 690 cubic kilometer is surface water and 432 cubic kilometer is groundwater and it is unequally distributed. India is a country of rivers. There are 12 major rivers with a total catchment area of 252.8 million hectares. The annual precipitation including snowfall is the main source of water in the country and is estimated to be around 4,000 cubic kilometer. The resource potential of rainfall for a country is estimated to be around 1869 cubic kilometers. Clearly, the water resources are thus unequally distributed over the country. The groundwater situation in different parts of the country is as varied as the surface water situation. In the high relief areas of the northern and northeastern regions occupied by the Himalayan range, the various hill ranges of Rajasthan and the central and southern India regions, the presence of very steep slope conditions and geological structures offer extremely high runoff and thus very little scope for rainwater to find favorable conditions of storage and circulation as groundwater. The large alluvial tract extending over 2000 km known as the Sindhu Ganga Brahmaputra Plains is the most potential region as far as groundwater resources are concerned. The coastal and deltaic tracts, particularly of the east coast, are caused by vast and extensive alluvial sediments and are very protective in terms of water availability. Resource use. Water resources have been a decisive factor in the growth and sustenance of human civilization since the ancient past. All the early civilizations were distinctively and predominantly riparian. Prime examples of ancient river valley civilizations of the world are the Egyptian civilization in the Nile Valley, the Mesopotamian civilization in the valleys of the rivers Tigris and Ephorates, the Harappan civilization in the Indus Valley and the Chinese civilization in the Huang Ho Valley. Harness of water from natural resources and its careful use in agriculture and other activities is a hallmark of these civilizations. 
archaeological evidences show that certain engineering measures were also adopted to enhance as well as sustainable water resources. Reservoirs are made, embankments are raised, wells are dug up, channels are created for transporting water to desired destinations, and devices are invented for utilizing the various properties of water. The written records are replete with such information and a sizable number of structures have survived the ravages of time to surprise us with their ingenuity even today. Some of the characteristic features related to the use of water as a resource of the first civilization on the Indian subcontinent are the environmental settings were arid or semi-arid, the importance of water as a resource was clearly understood. The habitation sites were selected with a lot of care so that the deposit of good alluvium soil for agriculture resulting from seasonal floods was regularly available. Canals were excavated in the river basin to take water to agricultural fields. A canal of this type has been traced near Shortughai, drawing water from the Kokcha River. Individual households that seldom changed their location made the wells for use the earliest evidence of the exploitation of groundwater. Drainage was carefully planned so that the waste did not pollute the fresh water resources. Towns like Dholavera, surrounded by Brackish water paid great attention to water storage. And at its peak, the entire city might have looked like a lake city or a Jaladurga. The area reserved for the tanks was immense, approximately 750 meters in length, and the southern and northern margins, while the width varied from 70 to 80 meters. In the west, the tank area was about 590 meters. Special and vulnerable areas, mostly on the exterior face, were encased with hammered rust stones. Several bunts were built across the breadth of the tanks to lessen the pressure of the stored water body on the steep walls, keeping in mind the overall slope of the steep. The bunts also served as causeways making transportation simpler. In times of low rainfall, they allowed water to be held in specific tanks rather than being spread out over a vast area and quickly depleted by evaporation and seepage. The entire drainage system might have been designed to save every drop of rainwater that fell in the steam. The water must have been a valuable commodity in a location with no perennial source of surface water and groundwater that is mostly brackish and saline and tends to dry up during the summer. The importance of water for agricultural societies during the Vedic period must have increased. The flow of water in channels for irrigation purpose was practiced. There are references to artificial waterways Kulya and Khanitrama Apha in Rig Veda. These perhaps refer to irrigation canals. The other expressions used for the same device are Sushira and Surmi, wells avat were dug up. Lifting devices to draw water from the wells were also in use, called Ansatrakosh and Ashm Chakra. These were probably composed of a leather bucket drawn over a pulley for lifting water from the wells. Mauryans, as the founder of one of the earliest empires, gave special importance to water resources. Likewise, Ashoka refers in his edicts to the construction of wells and watering places along the major routes. The epigraphic evidence affirms the construction of a big reservoir of water by damming a stream in the Jonagar district of Gujarat by Piyush Gupta, the governor of the region during Chandragupta Maurya's reign. 
The reservoir was named Sudharshana. Since medieval India was also a largely agricultural society, the resource use practice of water was geared at providing irrigation to the fields. Moreover, using most of the prevalent methods, a few new techniques were introduced during this period. The prominent among them were Arghata and Arhat, which improved irrigation significantly. In the 14th century, Firoz Tughlaq constructed a very elaborate network of canals, the rivers from which the canals were cut were Yamuna, Satluj, and Ghagar. The Mughals showed the same concern for the use of water resources. They also promoted irrigation facilities by providing loans to farmers to install irrigation devices. There was a general concern for better use and regulation of water resources. In South India, too, great emphasis was laid on the careful use of water resources. Raising empanelments and dams also channelized the streams of rivers. The famous Anai Kuttu on the Kaveri River was built by Chola rulers for the irrigation of the lands in Tanjore. Large dams were also built in this region for creating big reservoirs of water. Kakatiya rulers also known to have built three big dams in Varangal. Another dam located at Kamthana near Bidra, built by the Kakatiyas, supplied water for the irrigation to the neighboring region. The apathy and neglect shown by the new dispensation towards these age-old resource use practices resulted in the ruin of most of these devices. A major consequence of this was series of famines and consequent loss of life. Water conservation. Water is a renewable resource, yet it is also a limited resource. We have no more than we did throughout Harappan society, but the need has increased. Water has surpassed oil as a valuable resource. The two biggest challenges now are water scarcity and decreasing water quality. As a result, there is an urgent need to undertake water conservation measures. We must work together on a daily basis to protect the lands, rivers, lakes, aquifers, and seas from pollution. In this regard, prayer water saving practices must be thoroughly investigated. Water conservation has a long history going back to the earliest times. The need for conservation at the time was perhaps to save water for the lean period of the year. It was conservation directed at quantity, as quality conservation did not seem to be their concern. Ancient literature, epigraphy, archaeological remains, and local traditions all provide evidence for water conservation. Conservation was especially important in environments that were located far from a water supply or were naturally poor in water. Well digging is an age-old practice to use groundwater. Wells are also as old as Harappan folklore. Almost every Harappan residential unit contained a well. Mohan Judaro has almost 700 wells recorded. Unlike other running sources like rivers and streams, wells provided an option to fetch only the required amount of water, the early evidence of judicious use of water. Another source of water is running water, but particularly flood water was very nicely utilized by past cultures. We have the evidence from Srinagar Virpura, situated near Allahabad on the banks of the river Ganga. During the monsoons, the river swells up by about 7 to 8 meters and spills into the nearby artificial canals. Settlers of the region carry superfluous flood water dug this canal. This diversified water was stored in tanks to be used during lean periods of the year. The mechanisms of rainwater conservation 
however, differed according to the physiographic features of the respective regions. In Rajasthan, it was the rooftop method, whereas in the case of South India, it was the tank-based method. In Rajasthan, these mechanisms were known as kund or kundi. Individually, rooftops were used as catchment areas that collected rainwater and stored in underground tank. In the other words, kund or kundi was artificial wells conserving rain that would have otherwise run off. The mechanism was also used in open fields for the general public where similar kund or kundi were built and the neighboring areas were used as the catchment. A very indigenous method to secure drinking water was practiced in the run of Kutch by Maldharis. They knew that the density of sweet water was less than the saline water. On this theoretical premise, they were able to store rainwater afloat on underground saline water. It is known as the Vriddu method of water conservation. In the Northeast Himalayan region, people developed methods of carrying natural spring water for drinking purposes. As the region is mountainous, the rainwater runs off very fast. However, the upper range natural springs survive throughout the year. The people there used this intricate network of bamboo pipelines to carry water to convenient points where it was stored and subsequently used. A very interesting method of water harvesting is practiced by Jarvas in Andaman. Although the Andaman Islands have an annual rainfall of 3000 mm, it runs off rapidly due to the ragged physiography of the place. The Jarvas use full length split bamboo. An entire length of bamboo is cut longitudinally and placed along a gentle slope with the lower end leading into a shallow pit. These serve as conduits for rainwater that is painstakingly collected in pits called jack wells. A series of increasingly bigger jack wells are built, connected by separate bamboo so that overflows from one lead to the other, the bigger one. The stored water is used for domestic purposes. The evidence of tank and canal construction from the ancient past from different regions is also available Hanthi Gumpa inscription of the 2nd century BC. It describes that canal was dug in the Toshali division near the capital city of Kalinga. According to Kuntagri plates, the Kadamba king Ravi Varman ordered the construction of a tank band for irrigational purposes. Most of these water developed to channel water for optimal use, which otherwise would have gone to waste. Such an awareness of water conservation emerged due to the unequal seasonal distribution of rains. The plateau region taken is full of artificial tanks that stored rainwater for irrigation. These are known by various names like Arakkes, Volakir, Derikir, Kate, Kunte, Kola, etc. depending upon the difference in structure and nature of use. Similar structures are called Zing in Ladakh and Ahar in South Bihar where water from seasonal streams or rainwater is stored to be used in the ensuing period for the domestic and agricultural purposes. Ahars are rectangular catchments receiving water flowing through hilly rivers. Paliwal Brahmans in the arid region of Rajasthan developed a very useful method of water conservation for irrigation. They created rain-fed water storage structures known as kharim, which allowed runoff water to stand over a moist and soil bed of the storage structure itself. This piece of land was later used for growing crops. 
Haveli is another unique type of rainwater harvesting employed in Madhya Pradesh. The terrain has heavy black clay which can hold a lot of water but hardens and breaks as it dries. Bunds are built to collect rainwater and are released a few days before sowing through an aperture in the embankment. The discharge softens the soil, allowing wheat and gram sowing to rarely require a second helping. The preceding description makes abundantly evident that various methods of water conservation were traditionally performed depending on local demands. These technologies made use of every type of water supply imaginable, including rain, flood, and groundwater. Water rights. The detail of the resource use practice given above make it clear that water has been considered a useful essential resource. Therefore, rights to it have also been zealously safeguarded. In early times, however, the population was limited and it was often possible for individuals or communities to settle differences in many cases by simply moving on and exploiting a new source. The scale of water available in most situations and conceptual uses, even the irrigation seldom threatened others with deprivation. Gradually, greater rights began to be exercised and in many cases, the state initiated the practice of living cess on the use of water, especially on the water drawn from state-built reservoirs or similar devices. This trend was further strengthened with the multiple uses and increasing diversions for conceptual commercial use, which were often conflicting in practice. The problem has since then become more acute because of the increasing population. The increasing demand or availability has been creating scarcity and resultant disputes. Rivers that form natural boundaries are flowed through successive domains or territories and came to be used as a common highway was supposedly open to all for communication and commerce. However, some states began to exercise greater control over them, thereby denying others or reducing their usage of the resources. This necessitated the framing of some kind of laws as the dispute over ownership rights of water increased. Conventions about the Danube between Austria and Turkey in 1619 and the Rhine between Germany and France in 1697 were among the early landmarks in the making of modern international law on navigation. Historically, there have been the following principles defining water rights. Riparian doctrine. The private property right in water only to those whose land abutted the river was a viable theory so long as people living away from the river satisfied their needs from other sources. The prayer appropriation theory. According to this theory, water in the natural course is the property of the public. It is a suitable version of the riparian theory that puts the earlier appropriation rights, holders and advantages over all subsequent users. The territorial sovereignty theory. According to this theory, the owner has an absolute user right. This notion of private property when extrapolated for the entire domain of natural resources generates territorial sovereignty principles. The equitable apportionment theory. It says that treat all claimants as equal right holders and through their legal means apportion the resources by their individual needs. The equitable utilization theory. It says to distribute the resource equitably such that optimum utilization occurs for all concerned 
when all relevant factors are taken into account. The Community Interest Theory As a principle of distribution, this theory allows the groups participatory in the distribution to be defined as communities in various ways. Such a culture-specific groups are domicile-specific groups. The Public Trust Theory It emphasizes that the principles of distributive justs need not to be based only on the notion of private property. Rather, one should consider natural resources a common property and the sovereign or the state as its only trustee. In today's lecture, we have highlighted the various resource use practices of past societies. Further, the mechanism developed by these societies for the conservation of water was also discussed in the lecture. The lecture also gave a brief survey of various theories of water rights and their applications as well. So, with this, today's lecture comes to its conclusion. See you in the next session with some other topic. Till then, goodbye and goodbye.